Thanks so much for uh, being here. I really appreciate uh, you spending time with me today. So this is my first time at WSO2 conference. So this is sort of my introduction and introduction of my company to the uh, WSO2 community. And uh, it's really about you know just reiterating some of the key words that we've been hearing a lot during the conference, which is about the innovation, agility, and adaptability, right? So let's say you have innovative idea if uh, it takes too long, if it's too complicated for your clients to adopt that idea, then you may have solution, but your customer does not. So this talk is really about how we are providing, how we, a new wave as a company, is providing solution that's delivering value to our customer, which is our centers for Medicare and Medicaid services. And as you may know, uh, CMS, or Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they are the largest healthcare payer in the United States. And this is sort of our uh, you know, mantra. So we are an IT company, but our goal is to merge innovation, precision, and compassion to empower our clients to use technology in new ways so that they solve problems for the greater good. So when we um, solve a problem, we constantly remind ourselves of three things, right? That's people, process, and tools. And people always comes first. So this, uh, this is a slide uh, outlining some of the facts about our company. We are located in uh, Elkridge, Maryland, which is about 20 minutes south of Baltimore. Uh, and we're about 30 minutes uh, north of Washington, DC. We just opened a Agile Collaboration Center for uh, our clients to come and our clients and partners to come and have open and modern space where we can be creative. We have a presence in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. We have a development team in Harrisburg, Mississippi. We have about 250, uh, 250 people in our company. We are CMMI level four for service and we will be getting CMMI level four for development soon. We are ISO 9001 and 2015 certified company. And these are some of the programs that we support at CMS. So for um, Center for Medicare, uh, we recently migrated their, one of their legacy application from uh, CMS approved data center onto Azure uh, government cloud platform. And that was one of the first projects CMS to migrate an application into Azure uh, government uh, cloud. And associated with that is uh, you know, Ravi uh, see that for CPI for taking that legacy .NET application and then completely rewriting that application into Spring Boot based microservices. For Office of Enterprise Data and Analytics, OIDA, uh, we are the, uh, the prime contractor for CCW, Chronic Condition Warehouse, which is probably one of the largest data warehouse uh, that has information, uh, Medicare and Medicare, Medicaid beneficiary information starting from 1990, 1991. And then uh, for uh, CMCS, Center for uh, Medicaid and Chip Services, we are the system integrator for MacBiz, which is Medicaid and Chips business, inter, uh, business information system. Uh, we provide uh, you know, technical architecture guidance uh, for that uh, program. There you go. So uh, CCW uh, is sort of a project that's supporting uh, uh, Blue Button 2.0. And uh, you know, I know that there are a couple of talks about fire standards um, during a conference. So Blue Button is a fire a service that enables our patients to download their Medicare health information and also be able to share their information uh, with their providers utilizing Fire REST API. So we're very proud that, proud that you know, we were part of that uh, uh, effort to support uh, Blue Button 2.0. So this is just a little, um, uh, you know, it's an objective of, of CMS, which is to provide services for 70 million Medicaid beneficiaries and over 60 million Medicare beneficiaries. They develop health and safety standards 
for the providers and healthcare uh, services, which who are authorized by the uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And this chart shows you sort of uh, you know, uh, uh, Medic uh, uh, CMS's 2017 budget, which is over $1 trillion, right? So $1 trillion of uh, supporting uh, Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. And this is, I think this is why it's important for us to not just think about the technology, but how much of value that we are delivering to our customers. So what's the challenge? The challenge is that traditional way of creating application or developing products, it takes too long. And if you couple that with some of uh, federally uh, uh, mandated compliance, then the process can even take longer. And by the time you have a solution, that solution that you have just finished may be uh, you know, obsolete because of emerging technologies and innovations. And this is one of the examples of the challenges that we're facing. So CMS has what's called technical reference architecture, and it mandates an application to be broken down into se three separate zones, which are uh, firewall uh, network segments. On the right-hand side, you see the, uh, the, the presentation layer, which has you know, UI elements such as you, know, you may have uh, you know, your application that's running AngularJS or, you know, ReactJS, and it ha also has a web service that's running. In the middle tier, you have AppZone, which runs business logic. And TLA, TLA mandates that uh, application zone cannot talk directly to the data source, you know, which may be uh, databases such as, you know, Oracle database, uh, you know, MongoDB or uh, MySQL. It needs to have what's called data zone mediator, which can either be implemented using message queues, ESP, or XML appliances. So let's say you know, this is just one microservice, but multiply this by the number of microservices that you have. You will have to break down your uh, microservice into two different components that are deployed on two different network segments so that you know, it adds the complexity in terms of the deployment, and also, whatever change that you need to make to the application, you need to make in two different places. So the question is, is it possible to automate laborious and time-consuming application coding yet still deliver a customized and federally compliant solution? The answer is yes. The answer is Smart App. So Smart App is an uh, you know, application that we developed in-house. How many of you are you familiar with uh, J-Hipster here? How about Yeoman Generator? Great. <laughs> so uh, Yeoman Generator is a, a source code scaffolding, scaffolding tool. Uh, you know, it has a lot of uh, sub-generators generators that are uh, sp spitting out different um, source code for different languages and different platforms. And J-Hipster is a Yeoman generator that uh, produces Spring Boot-based application. And we have very closer, a close relationship with the creators and the developers of uh, J-Hipster community. So what we did was we took J-Hipster and we customized it for the Federal Space. So you know, we customized J-Hipster so that uh, you know, without the, the developer coding a line of code, they are able to generate uh, what's a TRA compliant three-zone architecture application. And we believe that it can save developers hundreds of you know, hours of manual coding. So this is uh, sort of you know, putting things in perspective. Traditionally, you spend a lot of time setting up your projects, uh, you know, doing the pipeline. You, know, you may be writing you know, for a spring application, you know, the controller, the service layer, um, the repository, uh, DTOs, and then you, know, you have to set up your unit tests, integration tests. You need to have uh, you know, UI generated you know, if, you have, if you have a CRUD type of application. 
So those are all good, but you know, they take a lot of time. And they are kind of repetitive, right? So you know, I don't think your client will go, wow, you have very good looking source code structure and you have generated a lot of lines of code, but what value does it bring to me, right? So the source that you have just worked on for maybe fewer, more weeks, it, doesn't, it hasn't really delivered value to the client yet. So that's what Smart App does. It uh, cuts out uh, project setup and any type of plumbing that's repetitive and that's manually uh, intensive so that you can focus on delivering value to your customers, which is to implement business logic and also spend time with the stakeholders so that you have better understanding of what this application needs to be. So these are the steps of using a small app. You know, the first step is, of course, you will talk to your uh, stakeholders, business owners, to make sure that you understand what their requirements are. And step two is download a Vagrant Box image, which has uh, everything that you need to uh, work with Small App, or you can set up your own local environment because Small App is just a, a, you know, a Node.js package. So uh, once you have a Java install, you just do npm init, and then it'll download every uh, module that you need in terms of using Small App. And from CLI or from UI, what you do is you pick uh, the type of application, which can be you know, monolithic, microservice, CMS three tier, or type of authentication, which can be basic HTTP uh, uh, authentication, OAuth 2, JWT, and type of database that you want to connect to. Whether you want to enable caching or not, utilizing EH cache or Hazel cast. Whether you want to have uh, support for advanced CSS uh, pre-processing, um, LAS or SAS. Do you want support for internalization? Do you want support for multilingual? And the type of testing framework they want to include, such as Gatling, Cucumber for uh, behavior-driven de development, and Protraction. So this is sort of like the landscape of all the technologies that are used within Small App. And this is a screenshot of you know, developer going through different options to choose how their application is going to be. And Smart App does NTD generation, meaning that it creates the complete CRUD pipeline for each type of entity that you specify. So you can specify the name of the entity, the field name, the type of the field, and any validation that goes into each field. And everything that's generated is uh, CMS3 is an architecture compliant. I missed a slide of uh, showing all the code that's generated, but it creates hundreds of uh, uh, code files that includes a unit test and integration test. And it also generates Docker file, so that you know, if, you are, if you wanna deploy your application onto Kubernetes, then you can just you know, run uh, you know, Docker and then just push out your image to, the local, uh, image to your private repository and then have it picked up by the Kubernetes cluster. So we have the application, but what about the infrastructure? Is there anything that we can do in terms of the infrastructure? That's uh, tier, uh, CMS TRA 3 zone compliant. The answer is yes. We have another tool called SPADE, self-provisioning and dashboard environment. What it does is that it automates the provisioning of imp infrastructure that's compliant to CMS's TRA. So what it does is that from the command line, user can specify the type of infrastructure that they want to create. It uh, provisions um, cloud resources, uh, such as VM, uh, VPC, subnet, uh, you know, network cards, storage. And then it puts that into a three-zone architecture. And on top of that, it deploys Kubernetes cluster automatically. It provides real-time monitoring using Elk Stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. And it's cloud agnostic, meaning that you can run on AWS and Azure. And like I mentioned, you, know, you can pick from different uh, template of architecture, or you can supply your own. So the benefit of using Spade is that 
you know, you can create multiple environments and each environment will look the same from each other, right? So when you deploy your application in your production environment, there are no, there are no surprises because you have already tested your code from dev, test, integration, QA, all the way up to production. So these are some of the benefits that I have mentioned. And this is sort of like high level architecture of Spade. You know, it's API driven so that, you know, the CLI and then user interface uses, um, you know, API that's provided by Spade. And then in the middle is the master Spade. And once the user uh, submits command to provision an environment, what it does is that it creates different tenants. Each tenant has its own private Docker registry. And every environment that's created is segregated from each other. This is different view of the same architecture. As you can see, it's got private Docker registry. And then um, each environment is broken down into a uh, three zone architecture, which is TRA compliant. So we have Smart App, which is an application development accelerator, which delivers federally compliant, secure application code in minutes versus days or maybe weeks. And we have Spade, which is a platform as a service and DevOps platform, which you can use to provision different environments that are uh, identical from each other. So what about in terms of CICD? So this is more a detailed view of how CICD is done within uh, Spade. This is a different view. So user creates an application using a small app. And then uh, the, uh, the developer checks in the code into GitHub. What's generated within small app is a uh, template for Jenkins job, which is deployed onto Spade. The job listens on any type of check-in that's uh, done on GitHub. And then uh, once check-in is done, it creates a Docker image that a Docker image is pushed onto private Docker repository for the particular tenant or particular environment. And that new Docker image is pushed out to Kubernetes using a uh, uh, rolling update of the Kubernetes feature. And that's how a CI CD is done. <coughs> is there any question? Yes. I'm curious if you would talk a little bit more about the uh, the separation to the data layer mm -hmm. that you were mm -hmm. talking about. There's what, what was it that you called it? So it's called a data zone mediator yeah. service. Explain how that works, and are you being mandated to implement it using those yes, methods that you mentioned? Mm -hmm. That's uh, within TRA uh, uh, framework. So. Uh, you cannot have direct access from application zone into the data source, which may be database, uh, you know, SQL or NoSQL. Right. So you need to have some sort of mediation service that's taking a message from the application, and then that service will be uh, getting data from the database. Okay. So and this, then uh, passing it on to the application. In the form of a SQL yes. statement, like an insert, delete update, something True. like that. And, uh, and, you know, it's for the security purpose. For example, you know, if there's any type of SQL injection, then that uh, data zone mediator sure. service is responsible for catching yeah. any I, type of attack. I understand the reason yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. what, I'm, what I'm curious about was where you mandated, you mentioned like three different ways that you could implement mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. One of them was XML, mm -hmm. the other was messaging, and something else. Yeah. Are you so, being told mm -hmm. that you have to implement that using those methods? So uh, what CMS, uh, CMS has, uh, software development life cycle called X, uh, XRC, expedited life cycle. And it's broken down into different phases, right? So when you are developing your application, what you need to do is you need to take your architecture to their TRB, which is technical uh, review board, right? Board, right? So they will ask you a question based on the TRA, right? So the architecture has to be reviewed by them. So, uh, if your application is not compliant to TRA, then you need to go back to your drawing board and then come back. 